Well, this morning will be the acid test. <laughs> I've actually had a bad sinus drainage and cough for a couple of weeks. And I've taken some Benadryl and it has seemed to help. And today will be the test case to see whether or not I can <clears throat> make it through the service. Lord, I just want to say one of the two Psalms from which you quoted, Psalm 117. And for your information, that's the shortest of 150 Psalms. It's the shortest. And when the petitioner there entered into the presence of the Lord, he didn't ask for anything. And how many times do we come before the Lord without asking for something? Give me, give me, give me, give me. We think of God as a smorgasbord. It is just there to serve our interest and our needs. Mm -hmm. But if you read that psalm, it's only two verses, the shortest of all the psalms. The petitioner didn't ask for one thing. All he did was praise the Lord. Something to think about. All right, if you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to invite you to the first chapter of John's Gospel. And I started and stopped so many times with our study of John's Gospel. But we have talked about some of the differences between its content and that of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And how that its prologue or beginning actually goes back into eternity past and finds one there whom we know to be our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who in time left the ivory palaces of heaven, came into this world in human flesh, and went to a cross and died thereon in payment of sin's penalty. In reading John's Gospel, in the introductory chapter, the word witness is used in speaking of the purpose of John the Baptist's coming. If you will look in John 1 verse 7, the same, speaking of John verse 6, came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. In these verses, we have both the noun and verb form translated a witness, the noun form, and to bear witness, the verb form. Now these two speak of the person as well as the testimony given. But what I want you to just primarily see early in chapter one of John, the subject of witness and bear witness comes into view. Now, if we go down to verse 15, we read there again, and John bear witness. And if we pass on down to verse 19, we read this is the record of John. And the word record is the same word witness. And then if we go to verse 32, and John bear record, 
verse 34, and I saw and bear record, all of these words are exactly from the same two Greek words, the noun and the verb. Witness, bear witness, record, bear record. So you can see the prominence of this word introductory to John's gospel. Now leaving John 1, we find in John's gospel that there are other words translated by the English testimony. John 8, verse 17. Testify, John 2, 25. And testify, John 4, 39. Now all of these words collectively, witness, bear witness, record, bear record, testimony, testify, and testified are all from the same two Greek words in the noun and verb form. As a matter of fact, the verb and noun are used 38 times in John's Gospel. Another 17 times in his epistles and another 18 times in the book of Revelation, which he also authored for a total of 73 times John uses this word in his writings. In the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. Let me say again, 38 times in John's Gospel. 17 times in his epistles. You say, I don't even remember the word in his epistles. How about this verse? 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 18, 17 times in his epistles and 18 times in the book of Revelation, which he also offered. He uses this particular word, witness, bear witness, record, bear record, testimony, testify, testify, more than all the writers in the New Testament put together. It's an important feature of his gospel. Witness. The words are used in their primary sense, namely to give competent testimony Concerning that which one has himself seen, heard, or experienced. The emphasis on testimony should not be overlooked or minimized. There is a legal error about it. Testimony is a serious matter. And it is required to substantiate the truth of the matter. It is clear that our author wants us to take what he writes as reliable. He is insistent that there is good evidence for the things that he sets down. Witness establishes the truth. It does more. It commits a man. If I take my stand in the witness box and testify that such and such is the truth of the matter, I am no longer neutral. I have committed myself. John's writing lets us see that there are those who, like John the Baptist, have committed themselves by their witness to Christ. Now, if you will turn to John chapter 5, verse 31. This to me is one of the more unusual verses that you'll read anywhere in the scripture. In John 5, 31, Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus Christ could say anything but the truth? But here he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. But the one who said that also said, I am the truth. 
John 14, 6. Amen. And referred to himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, Revelation 3, verse 14. Now, what he says here has to be compared to another scripture. Because if you turn to the 8th chapter of John's Gospel, John chapter 8, <clears throat> and notice verse 14. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. Now, hold on a minute. He just said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And here, three chapters later, he said, if I bear record of myself, my record is true. But now, there's a simple explanation to the difficulty posed. But we know that what he said in John 5, 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true, that those words cannot be taken literally as if he meant that what he said with reference to himself was not true to fact. If that were the, were the correct idea, Jesus would cease to be sinless. But now, first of all, you have to consider his audience in John 5. Now let's turn back there for just a minute. In John chapter 5, when he spoke it, the words, who was his audience? Verse 18 identifies them as the Jews who sought the more to kill him. So the Jews who sought to kill him. Now listen to me, this is a hostile audience. Now, verse 19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, and he gives them a lengthy discourse of claims regarding himself. And then when he comes to the end of that, he says in verse 31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now this audience sought to kill him, this audience, according to chapter 5, verse 38, were those said to be by him who have not his word abiding in you. Now listen to me. He didn't say they didn't have the scriptures. What he said was you have not his word abiding in you. It wasn't in their heart. They had it. And he told them to search the scriptures. But they didn't have those scriptures in their heart. Because had they had those scriptures in their heart, then they would have known those scriptures testified of the one who was here speaking. Thus he said, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now let me just put this in a political environment. And I don't mean anything by it to class anyone in a special way. But let's say I'm a Democrat and the audience is Republican. And if you don't like that, well, let's say I'm a Republican, the audience is Democrat, or I'm a Democrat and the audience is Republican. It, it doesn't make any difference. But if I'm a Republican speaker and I'm before a Democratic audience and I tell you the best candidate to vote for president is Mr. Blank. And you're sitting there, what's your thought? That's your opinion. You certainly don't agree with it. You certainly don't agree with it. Now, I personally think when Jesus said, if I bear record of myself, my record is not true according to your testimony. Now, let me show you that that follows. Turn to chapter 8. In chapter 8, Jesus made an incredible claim, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Now when he made that claim, notice verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, 
thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Now, if we go back to chapter 5, that's exactly what is meant. My witness is not true according to you. But here he says, my witness is true. Now notice. They said, thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. In other words, I know who I am. I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whether I go. Ye judge after the flesh. Which means what? Ye judge after the flesh. They looked at him in view of the claims that he made. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. They said, thou art not yet 50 years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? Their judgment was according to the flesh. But they failed to realize that the one who resided in that flesh was very God himself. Amen. Ye judge after the flesh. My judgment is true. For I am not alone. But I and the Father that sent me. It is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Now let me just make a statement that a lot of people don't realize. Jesus Christ never said anything and never did anything except what the Father willed that he say and do. He never acted independently of the Father's will who sent him. Amen. Look in John chapter 8, verse 26. Middle of the verse. But he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have, what? Heard of him. Now what I'm speaking, he said, is not my words, but the words of him that sent me. Now, go to the 12th chapter. Verse 49. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Chapter 14. Verse 24. Middle of the verse. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now, let me tell you something. Was he bearing witness of himself? What he said was the very word of the Father who sent him. And what he did was the very works of the Father who sent him. Now, notice how he deals with this back in chapter 5. And how important testimony and witness is in John's gospel. Now, verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. That is in the estimation of this audience who, who are unbelieving Jews. But we know according to what he said in 8 verse 14, his witness was true. 5 verse 32, there is another that beareth witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Now, let's just count the witnesses in John's gospel. Verse 33, ye sent unto John, and what he did, he bare witness unto the truth. Now, the witness that he bare is given in chapter 1, verses 19 to 34. I'm not going to recapitulate that, but let's count John the Baptist as a witness. Ye sent unto John. He bear witness of the truth. But you know what the author of this gospel wrote in one of his epistles? 
If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If we receive the witness of men, yes, we do. But the witness of God is greater. So he says in 5 verse 34, But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now, witness number one, John the Baptist. Witness number two, the works which the Father gave me to do bear witness of me that he sent me. The works that I do. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Yeah. The works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now turn to John chapter 12. And let's add to that company. John chapter 12, verse 17. Now this is after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and he's headed for Jerusalem to make his triumphal entry. And in that procession, a number of people are following him as he went. Notice what John 12, verse 17 says. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, did what? What did they do? They bear a record. They bear a record. Who bear a record? Eyewitnesses were there when he called Lazarus out of the grave. For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. Listen, that's why they followed him. Witness number one, John the Baptist. Witness number two, the works which the Father gave me to do, the same bear witness of me. Look at John 5, verse 37. And the Father himself, huh, which has sent me, had borne witness of me. But here's your problem. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Now you know what the voice of God was at the time of this writing? It was Jesus Christ. He was the voice of God. Half in his last days spoken unto us by his son. You haven't heard his voice. Jesus Christ was the very voice of God, nor seeing his shape, he was very God manifest in the flesh. Amen. So much so that he could say that he that has seen me has seen the Father. Mm -hmm. But Jesus said, when you bypass me, you hadn't heard his voice. You hadn't seen his shape. Because what I said is what he has given me to say, and what I've done is what he's given me to do. I'm very God manifest in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Witness number three, the Father. Notice in 5 verse 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which what? What do they do? They testify. They bear record of me. Witness number one, John the Baptist. Number two, the works. Number three, the Father. Number four, the scriptures. You tell me I bear record of myself? And he begins to lay the evidence out. Now let me tell you something. Let's go back into chapter 4. How many of you remember the story of chapter 4 with a Samaritan woman? Mm -hmm. Jesus had never met this woman before. And yet he revealed things about her past that he had no way of knowing apart from their having met. And this woman in John 4, verse 25, said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Amen. I'm him. Now, this lady had her water pot. That's all she was interested in was filling her water pot. When she had this conversation with Jesus, you know what she did? Verse 28, she left her water pot and she went into the city. 
And you know what she did in the city? She gave testimony. She bare record. Look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which did what? Testify. Same thing. Bear record, bear witness. He told me all that ever I did. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Jesus in the upper room, speaking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, said, John 15, verse 26, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall do what? Huh? What will he do? He will testify of me. And who was present to hear that? The apostles, exclusive of Judas Iscariot, he had already left. Notice what he said in verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, let's just count the witnesses. I bear witness of myself. No, you sent unto John. He bear witness of the truth. The works that the Father gave me to do bear witness of me. The Father himself bears witness of me. The scriptures bear witness of me. The Samaritan woman bore witness of me. The Holy Spirit will bear witness of me. The apostles would bear witness of me. It's witness, 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 witness after witness in John's gospel. Amen. And that's why when he said the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we, the author, put himself among those eyewitnesses. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw him. Our hands have handled the word of life. We ate with him. We drank with him. We touched him. We know. We speak what we have seen and what we've heard. And that's a great part of John's gospel. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something. There are people today who are willing to die for right as well as wrong. Being willing to die for what you believe doesn't prove you were right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Because you can die for wrong as well as right. That's right. Mm -hmm. There are suicide bombers today that take their own life and die for wrong. Being a martyr doesn't prove you were right or wrong. That's right. It may say something of the sincerity of the one who gave his life, <clears throat> but you can die for right as well as wrong. But these witnesses, one of whom wrote this gospel, these men went right down into the face of death rather than recant what they believed and preached. You know why? Because what they preached was not just abstract ideas. They preached sensible facts, facts that rested upon their seeing, upon their hearing, and they would not be dissuaded otherwise. Yeah, that's right. And so when word came, we can't or die, they said, we'll die. We'll die for what we believe. And they went down in the face of death one by one rather than recant what they believed. Now, when you turn to the 21st chapter of John's Gospel, I don't have time to deal with this this morning, but in chapter 21, <clears throat> there is in the presence of Jesus two disciples. One of them is named Peter. I personally believe the other was John himself who authored the book. I don't have time to prove that this morning. But I want you to notice what he said in John 21, verse 24. This is the disciple which testifies of these things. This is the disciple who bear record, which testified of these things and wrote these things. Listen, that man was alive to give testimony to the truth as to the identity and claims of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But I, my point is, don't miss, and perhaps you've never thought about how important <clears throat> the subject of witness is in John's gospel. But it's so important 
and so important in the writings of John. If you'll turn over to the book of Revelation, which is something that he also wrote, if you just look at the introduction to the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who did what? <laughs> who bear record? Who bear record of the word of God and of what? The testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he what? That he saw. Bear record. The last book goes out with that same subject matter, <laughs> same writer. It's so important to know that Jesus Christ did not bear record of himself. <clears throat> and yet his word was true. It was absolute truth. But what he said in principle to this audience was, you've made a mistake. You've never heard God's voice because you've rejected what I've said. You've never seen his shape because you deny that I'm him in the flesh. But if you just would have known the scriptures at your disposal, you would have known that they testify of me. They wouldn't believe. But I'm thankful today that we have a written record that is laid down by eyewitnesses of the claims and words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, another of the same author's writing, notice how he begins this writing, verse 1 of chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have what? We have heard. Which we have what? We have seen. We have heard. We have seen with our eyes. Now in case you're interested, have heard and have seen are perfect tense. They're perfect tense. The perfect tense speaks of something that took place in the past, the results of which are present and persist through time. This particular epistle was written in approximately 90 AD. If Jesus Christ left this earth in 35 AD, I'm just going to hypothetically use that, then what you're reading here in this first epistle was some 55 years after Jesus Christ left this earth. But this writer was still alive. And what he heard and what he had seen 55 years before was still indelibly impressed and living in his mind. I saw him, I heard him, I still see him, I still hear him. I'll never forget his words. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. For the life was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and showing you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard Seen and heard, speaking of what? An eyewitness. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is a message which we have heard of him. Now of him is not about him. This is a message that we have heard from him. 
from him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I'll tell you, it's a great testimony of an eyewitness. So when you read that little gospel of John, and read 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, you underscore witness, bear witness, record, bear record, testify, testify, testimony, all of those words, same word. And John's writing was about eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Maybe stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trust him. Only trust him. And that's what I would say to everyone in this audience. If you've never reached a time in your life where you have personally put your trust in him, to whom the know right is life eternal, you ought to do that Amen. while it is yet day. Because there will come a time when that opportunity is lost forever. Is lost forever. But this one of whom we speak was very God manifest in flesh. And he came into this world for the purpose of paying for the penalty of sin, that the sinner might go out free. And he offers that payment as a free gift. Will you receive it? Will you reject it? And just remember that people will not die and go to hell because they're sinners. That's right. They die and go to hell because they rejected the payment that was made and offered as a free gift. That's right. Therefore, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed yeah. in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you know him? Let's sing, brother. Come on. Come on. Someday the now will run out. It'll run out. And you'll have to answer that question in eternity. What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful.